you have your Bibles, your electronic device, if you can get to Proverbs chapter 5, we're continuing our series on Proverbs. It's a third message. I want to tell you a little bit about Proverbs. Proverbs belongs to a category or a genre of literature that's known as wisdom literature. It stands alongside of Job, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, and also portions of uh, Psalms, all of it wisdom literature. The design of wisdom literature is what you might expect. It's designed to help readers, hearers increase in wisdom. The wise sayings serve to foster good character, right thinking, honorable behavior. The typical audience for wisdom literature were young people that were being prepared for leadership, although the book of Proverbs here has a mixed audience. It would seem there's a preponderance of young people, but there's also some old, wizened veterans that are present that still need to grow uh, in wisdom. Uh, Proverbs, as wisdom literature, deals... uh, It's different than other portions of the Bible. It It doesn't make promises. What it does is it tells you how life is or how life should be. In fact, you could say that what Proverbs does is tell, deal with probabilities, how life most probably will turn out. In, in other words, if you work hard, uh, Proverbs says you'll prosper. Well, that's most probably the case. In most cases, it would be that. In Psalm 90, which is a portion of wisdom literature, talks about longevity. It says 70 years, 80 with striving. That's not a promise. That's just a general observation of life, 70 to 80. There might be ones that live more, plenty do, some that lead less, uh, live less. So it deals uh, predominantly in probabilities. We're going to be in Proverbs 5 today, a little bit of 6, and draw a little bit from 7. What we're going to talk about is we're going to talk about temptation, specifically sexual temptation, marriage, and then God's better way. So let's, uh, let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for goodness and grace. Thank you for the gospel. Thank you for the promises in the gospel, the promise of forgiven sin, the promise of eternal life. But, Lord, the promises that there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We can be honest. We can confess our sins and repent and turn from the promise that you're a good and a, a, a glorious God. We don't have to be looking anywhere else to somehow fulfill needs. The fact, Lord, uh, the promise that if we, if we partake of you, if we receive you, that we're not going to thirst for anything else anymore, Lord, that you are fully satisfying. Thank you for all the different various and myriads of promises that are contained in the gospel. I pray, Lord, for the anointing of your Holy Spirit to rest upon me. Thank you for your word. I pray that by your spirit you would just make it alive to everyone that's here, Lord, that we would be attentive, that we'd be focused, and we would receive and hear what you want us to hear today. In Jesus' name, amen. So at the risk of speaking the obvious, we live in a sex-saturated culture. It screams out at us from billboards, television screen, Hollywood, all kinds of literature, the classroom, the university, uh, social media, internet generally, everywhere you go, it seems, in every place you end up stopping at, we have this message, and the message goes something like this, kind of get all the pleasure you can out of life, you can sleep with whoever you want, whenever you want, however you want, and you can have sex with impunity, there's no real downside to it. Yet God has another message, And God says that illicit sex, that's sex beyond God's prescribed boundaries, that illicit sex has devastating consequences. And he gives us a new way and a better way, a a, a way of forgiveness, a way of healing, a way of wholeness, a way of strength, and a way of purity. And we're going to look at that this morning. We're in Proverbs chapter 5. In order to get the context here, think of this. This is a father writing to his son or a father writing to his sons. Now, I want to allow you, I'm going to make some application, but I'm going to allow you to make some application because this is a father talking to his son about some tempting women that he should avoid. So you can, do the, you can do it in your own brain, and you can reverse it and say tempting men or whatever the case may be. You can make that application. This is written 
uh, predominantly to young people, and this is to a, a, a younger man. You can make the application there too, middle-aged, older, whatever the case may be. If I, had to, if I had to invest the time to help make all those things for you, we'd just never get through it, and you'd lose the sense of it anyhow. So it's Proverbs chapter 5. He says, my son, this is dad talking to the son, my son, be attentive to my wisdom. What we're going to see here in the first six verses is what I call the trap. This is the, the, the trap. My son, be attentive to my wisdom. Incline your ear to my understanding. And the trap has some bait in it. I don't know. When I was a kid, we used to do things where we tried to uh, catch animals, and we created traps, and we had bait in it. Or if you're a fisherman, you go out and you put bait on the hook, something that looks attractive, something that's going to uh, get the eye or the taste buds or some kind of a physical sense of whatever it is you're trying to capture. He says, incline your ear to my understanding that you may keep discretion and your lips may guard knowledge. He says, for the lips of a forbidden woman drip honey. The lips of a forbidden woman drip honey and her speech is smoother than oil. Let me say right off the bat when we talk about the bait, the trap is baited with, here's one thing, flattering words. It says, the lips of a forbidden woman drip honey, and her speech is smoother than oil. In fact, in Proverbs 6, the scripture says, uh, speaks of the smooth tongue of the adulteress. In Proverbs 7, it says, with much seductive speech, she persuades him. With her smooth talk, she compels him. All at once, he follows her as an ox goes to the slaughter, or as a stag is caught fast till an arrow pierces its liver. Boy, really vivid language. As a bird rushes into a snare, he does not know that it will cost him his life. So the dad is saying, be careful. Be careful out there. There's temptation out there. Be careful. He says the lips of a forbidden woman drip honey. In other words, it looks like it's going to be appealing. It looks like it's going to be good. Her speech is smoother than oil, but in the end, she's bitter as wormwood. Wormwood's poison. In other words, she's poisonous, and the words are poisonous, sharp as a two-edged sword. Her feet go down to death. In fact, the, the, the end result of this is death. Her feet go down to death. Her steps follow the path to Sheol. That's the place of the dead. She does not ponder the path of life. Her ways wander and she does not know it. So the first thing we're looking at here is the, the, the trap. And we're talking at this point about sexual temptation, specifically the trap and its baited, what? Flattering speech. Oh, um, it's, it's difficult, I think, at least it was for me as I considered it, to define flattering speech, but I kind of know it when I hear it. There is a difference between flattering speech and edifying words, but I think you can all imagine what flattering speech might be. It might be the woman saying to the guy, like, boy, any woman would just be so blessed to have you as a husband. You're so smart. You're so wise. You're so strong. You're so whatever. And of course, on the flip side of that, again, we, we could do it. It could be the guy saying to the, the woman, boy, I'll tell you, your husband's just a real idiot. He doesn't appreciate what he has. You're so smart. You're so wise. You're so beautiful. This flattering speech. Um, so anyhow, here we have it. We have the trap set. And what's, what's the bait? The first thing that we see here is this flattering speech. What, what ought that to tell us? It ought to tell us that we ought to have discerning, discriminating ears. We ought to be careful to what we're listening to. And then secondly, and we see this actually, I'll draw from Proverbs 6 and 7. In Proverbs 6, 25, the scripture says this. This is the second, there's two, it's baited with two pieces of bait. The first are the flattering words. The second have to do with what I'll call the appealing visual. Proverbs 6.25 says, Do not desire her beauty in your heart. Do not let her capture you with her eyelashes. Proverbs 7 says, And behold, the woman meets him. This is in Proverbs 7. We have sort of somebody watching and saying, Look, here's this guy, this young guy, and he's really dumb, and he's unsuspecting, and he's in a wrong place, and here's the woman. The woman meets him dressed as a prostitute, wily of heart. In other words, this idea of dressed as a prostitute, she's dressed in some kind of provocative way. She's dressed in some way to attract his attention. She's dressed in some way to advertise her wares, so to speak, to advertise what she has that he can avail himself of. So the second thing has to do with what I'll call appealing 
visuals. And especially as he addresses the son, there is an awareness there that, 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 that especially for, for men, there's something to be said for the visual. There has something to be said for, for looks and sight and that kind of a thing. In Proverbs 7.10, when it says the woman meets him dressed as a prostitute, wily of heart. I want to just point out wily of heart because when I was exegeting the text, it just really jumped out at me. This idea of, of wily of heart has to do with guarded in heart. So what, what she's doing is she's saying, you can have my body, but you can never have my heart. We're never going to be able to connect on that kind of a level. This is just body only. So we have this, we have this uh, trap. We have these flattering words, and we have these attractive visuals. You ever think, I was actually thinking about this. The devil says, the Bible says about the devil that he comes as an angel of light. In other words, he looks good, he looks uh, uh, appealing, but he's a liar and he's a murderer. You know what? Why is it that, that things that are bad and things that are evil are never ugly? They, they always look good. I, I wouldn't say exhaustively, but they all, wouldn't it be so much easier if what was evil was just ugly so you could immediately just say, oh, who wants that? <sighs> just be repelled by it, but it's not, it's not the case, see, because... Because the devil kind of baits that hook and our own fleshly desires. Here's what I, if I were preaching another sermon too, I'd probably go this way. You know, it, it seems to me perfectly logical and consistent with Scripture that the devil actually knows you and knows your weaknesses and knows your propensities and that he does what he needs to do that's within his power to do to set up temptations that are directed just at your, your weak spot. The Scripture says this in James, so we get temptation right. He says, let no one say when he is tempted I am being tempted by God for God cannot be tempted with evil and he himself tempts no one so God doesn't tempt each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire then desire when it has conceived gives birth to sin and sin when it is fully grown brings forth death so what we have here is we have the trap. It's baited with the flattering words, the attractive visuals. What we have is we have a hook here. This is like a fish that's, that's out there, and you're fishing, and there's the hook, but it doesn't look like a hook. What it looks like is something good. It looks like something the fish is going to want, and he jumps down on that, and all of a sudden he's hooked. So this is the, the, the trap here, and Dad's talking about this trap. And then we go on in verses 7 through 14, and he talks about, and this is God's inspired word, talks about the devastating consequences of infidelity, devastating consequences of adultery, devastating consequences of sexually immoral behavior. He says in verse 7, and now, O sons, listen to me, as if Dad said, look, listen up. You don't want to miss this. Do not depart from the words of my mouth. Keep your way far from her. In other words, stay away from that. You can't play with sin. You can't get near sin. You can't entertain sin. See, we're all tempted in many ways, and temptation is going to come to us. We're not going to be able to avoid temptation, but we don't have to entertain it. We don't have to get more of it into our life than is necessary. In other words, if you can stay away from the things that you know are going to be tempting to you, stay away from them. Keep your way far from her. Don't go near the door of her house, lest you give your honor to others. First thing you want to see that's a consequence of infidelity, of sexual immorality, sexual indiscretion, adultery. This word honor can also be strength. What it is is a loss of strength. You pour yourself, you pour your, your energy in a, into someone or in a direction that should be going elsewhere. So there's a loss of strength. And the scripture goes on, and the years... To the mer and your years to the merciless. I would take that is it's a loss, a loss of years. It's a loss of time. The one, one commodity is definitely recyclable, uh, non-recyclable, there may be others, is time. Once time's gone, you can't get it back. I will say this, one of the glories of the gospel is he says he'll restore the year, years the canker worm is written or, or eaten. He'll make up for that. He'll take care of that. He's able to do that. But what do we have? What are some of the consequences here he's talking about? One is loss of strength. Two is the loss of years. You're not getting them back. Once they're gone, they're gone. The text goes on. It says in 10, actually 10 plays off of uh, the beginning of 9, lest strangers take their fill of your strength and your labors go to the house of a foreigner. I'd also draw from that too, uh, especially the second part of 10. Your labors go to the house of a foreigner. It's a loss of wealth and money. What I thought of uh, immediately when I was doing this text is some of the high-profile divorce cases that we've, we've seen. Um, 
I actually was reading about Tiger Woods' divorce from a number of years ago. I think it costs like $750 million. We're looking at Jeff Bezos recently from Amazon. You know, he's worth $150 billion. I don't know what his wife is getting in a divorce settlement, but I would assume it's somewhere around half of that. And you just, you question yourself, like, Jeff, was this mistress worth $75 billion? It will cost you in your, your wealth. And your money, verse 11, it says, at the end of your life you groan when your flesh and body are consumed. A loss of health. Verse 12 says, you say how I hated discipline. I'll I'll allude to this a couple different times. It's threaded through here, the importance of discipline, the importance of self-discipline, the importance of discipline generally. I take the discipline of the Lord that helps keep you in line. You say how I hated discipline and my heart despised reproof. I did not listen to the voice of my teachers or incline my ear to my instructor. Boy, Just not teachable, not listening, not learning from history. Verse 14 says, I am at the brink of utter ruin in the assembled congregation. There's also the loss of reputation. The loss of reputation. In the spheres that I travel in with pastors, ministry, leaders, uh, I have seen so many people sin morally and, and fall. And the recovery, see, here's the thing. The recovery of the reputation never takes place 100%, because there's always people that know, and there's always people that question, and there's always people that doubt. So there's a loss of reputation in Proverbs 5, verse 5. The scripture says, her feet go down to death. In Proverbs 7, verse 32 and 33, this is from the New Living Translation. He says, the man, the man who commits adultery is an utter fool. For he destroys his own soul. Wounds and constant disgrace are his lot. His shame will never be erased. Wow, these are heavy words. I don't know if you really let it sink in. But we have the trap and sexual temptation comes. And when you fall to that and when you bow the knee of that and when you succumb to that, there are devastating consequences with it. Ultimately, there's a way that seems right to a man, but the end is Death, unrepentant sin, ends in death. And then Solomon, who's writing this, shifts gears, and he's talking to his son who's married, and he's gone through the trap, he's gone through the consequences. Now, what he says to him, I think it's really interesting what he says. There's two places we're going to go with this. We're going to go to marriage, and then we're going to go to God's best way. But what he doesn't say to him, he says, look, uh, he doesn't say, you know, this sexual desire that you're feeling, uh, I I don't want you to just be like white knuckling. You just got to be strong and you just got to resist and you just got to stand firm. I mean, he talks about the importance of discipline both before and after, but that isn't really the word that he gives his son, his married son. Make this qualification here, his married son. Here's what he says to his married son. He says, Drink water from your own cistern, flowing water from your own well. What, this is a metaphor, and he uses, I mean, the idea, Hob, is this uh, very thirsty person. He says, drink water from your own cistern. What he says, his answer, in fact, Roy Ortland, good Bible scholar, good pastor and preacher, he says this, he puts it like this. He says, God's remedy for your thirst for sex is sex, overflowing sexual joy with your wife. He doesn't say white knuckle in the face of temptation. What he says is the answer to that sexual desire is connecting with your wife in marriage. You guys just, you know, this is, I, our church is, you guys, I really like all you guys. I mean, I love you guys. But it happens just like this in the early service. It, it's almost like when I was talking to one of my kids when they were little and trying to talk to them about the birds and the bees and they just get like super quiet. <laughs> you, you, this, this is God's way. He's affirming. He's saying, look, li, li, listen, my married son, here's what God has done for you. Make a priority of your marriage. Make a priority of the relationship with your wife. Make a priority of of connecting with your wife. That's what he says here. 
I mean, it's just real. Drink water from your own cistern, flowing water from your own well. Should your springs be scattered abroad, streams of water in the streets, let them be for yourself alone, not for strangers with you. And then in verses 18 through 20, some of your translations, mine says, let your fountain be blessed. Some of your translations say, may your fountain be blessed. What you got going on here is a prayer of, for, of a father over the marriage bed of his son and daughter-in-law. What he's saying is this, he says, may your fountain be blessed and rejoice in the wife of your youth. Uh, as the years roll by, rejoice in the wife of your youth. As the years roll by, she's always going to be the wife of your youth. I tell my wife sometimes, I mean, we had a first date when she was 17. And I tell her, I say, you know, you're always going to be 17 to me. I said, my eyes are always 17. Something that's... She's always going to be the wife of your youth. He says, let your fountain be blessed and rejoice in the wife of your youth. A lovely deer, a graceful doe. Let her breast fill you at all times with delight. That's actually in the Bible. Ooh, here we go. Everybody heads down. <laughs> right now, now you probably have like a sixth or seventh grader with it. Now you're going to have to talk about that afterwards, right? And now you'll be angry with me. Don't be. This is the Bible. It says, let her breast fill you with, at, at all times with delight, be intoxicated always in her love. Why should you be intoxicated, my son, with a forbidden woman? So, uh, and this is a prayer of a father over a son's and daughter-in-law's marriage bed. So, he says, Here, here's the solution to your legitimate sexual desire. It's making love with your wife. And then, remarkably, again, I don't want to be crass about it, I just want to be biblical, is he, he then addresses what I would call issues of quality and quantity or quality and frequency. Oh, now we're really getting messed up here, right? Listen, he says um, in verse 18, he says, let her breast fill you at all times with delight. And then it says, be intoxicated always in her love. De delight and intoxicated point to the quality of your connection in marriage, the way that you ought to love one another, the way you ought to uh, give yourself to one another, the way that you ought to serve one another in love. In other words, he's saying, you know, in, in this sexual intimacy in marriage, it ought, to be, it ought to be good. And it ought to be for one another's good. But then in terms of frequency, he says this, let her breasts fill you at all times, be intoxicated always in her love. So what he, what he says is that your intimate connection in marriage ought to be good and it ought to be frequent. Now, I recognize there's reasons why sometimes that doesn't happen. I recognize all the fragility and vulnerability and all the things. I recognize physically. I recognize all of that. The, what the Bible teaches in Proverbs says, this is how it ought to be. This is how it ought to be. And, of course, sin has messed up a, a lot of that. So you cultivate a good relation. He says this. Here's the, here, here's the trap. And it, it, it's baited with flattering words. It's baited with visual appearance. It draws, it pulls upon you. And he says, but here's the downside. Here's all the things. You're going to lose your health. You're going to lose your wealth. You're going to lose your reputation. Your soul's going to be destroyed. You're an utter fool if you go down that road. But here's the thing. What, what I found in life, you can give people warnings. You can give your kids warnings. You can tell them the consequences of what's going to happen. And still, you know what? All of us have this remarkable ability to think that we're going to be the exception. That's not going to happen to us. They always catch the speeders down here at this speed trap, but that ain't happening to me. All these things happen to people that you know, uh, sin sexually and break their marriage. Well, that hasn't happened to me. In fact, see, Christians are great. Here, I, it, see, I, I want to pastor till I die, so I'm never going to be able to write the book I'd like to write, which is all the things that I've learned through the years. Uh, here, here it is. Uh, pastor, I just think I married the wrong one. <laughs> Guess what? Whoever you're married to, that's the one. I married the wrong one. That, that's always a, a lead up to, they kind of have their eye out there on who might be the one that they just missed. So, 
Anyhow, I mean, what the scripture says here, says to the married man, says to the married woman, that the answer to sexual temptation is building and fostering a good intimate relationship in your marriage. The Bible teaches that sexual intimacy in marriage is an expression of oneness. It fosters oneness. And it's also, believe it or not, you see alluded to here, but in 1 Corinthians 7, you see it very clear. It's also a hedge against sin. He said, I've given you this to help you in your battle against temptation and the devil. Now, the text then transitions in a, a really incredible way, in a way that applies to both married. Because, see, sometimes, sometimes marriage just doesn't work out the way you would like it to, even if you make your greatest investment. Sometimes marriages end. Sometimes marriages break up. Sometimes marriages are disappointing and, and unsatisfying. And, and sometimes these wonderful words that are spoken in these four verses just aren't a, a reality. I will say this to you, this, that... Even a difficult marriage, even a difficult marriage still testifies to the faithfulness of Jesus because the Bible says that marriage is to reflect in some way Christ's love for the church. Christ's love for the church is a covenant-keeping love that doesn't break covenant even when, in our case, the bride gets really bad. So even when you're in a difficult marriage, don't, don't, don't look to get out of it. If it's already broken then it's broken. But here's the point. What God does, what we do here in the Bible, is even if you have a difficult marriage, even if you had a disappointing marriage, even if you have an unsatisfying marriage, even if you have a marriage that doesn't come close to the four verses that I just read, and you're, sin and you're single, we can do this single or married. Single, and you're struggling with temptation. You're married, and you're struggling with temptation, and things don't seem to be going well. Here's what God does. I think this is unbelievable. God gives this better way, this best way, this ultimate answer. See, in verse 21, it says, For a man's ways are before the eyes of the Lord. Like, how does it make that transition? Even if we read it, the, the word translated for here, the Hebrew word here in verse 21, could also be because, why should you be intoxicated, my son, with a forbidden woman, and embrace the bosom of an adulteress because a man's ways are before the eyes of the Lord and he ponders all his past. Now there's a one sense of this saying look everything that you do God knows. So you got that kind of sense right? This is like and it seems like the writer of Proverbs is trying to say look you, you better be aware because this isn't just the downside I just talked about. God's watching but you know, the more I looked at the text, and let me read through the rest of it, it says, a man's ways are before the eyes of the Lord. He ponders all his past. The iniquities of the wicked ensnare him. He's held fast in the cords of his sin. He dies for lack of discipline, and because of his great folly, he is led astray. You know what? When I started looking at it a little bit more closely, a man's ways are before the eyes of the Lord. And looking at this in light of the whole scripture, he says, a man's ways are before the eyes uh, of the Lord. You know what he's saying here? He said, this answer, the temptation, this answer, in even, in, even in marriage and the challenge, this, this, this answer, the way that you're going to overcome this, uh, ultimately is not in your own strength. God knows you. God is looking at you. God knows how weak you are. God knows how susceptible you are to temptation. God knows how often you've tripped up. God knows how often you've fallen. And because he cares for you so much, he has given you Jesus, and what's being, what's, what's being said here, and I want to say it to you, you're struggling with sexual temptation, you're dealing with disappointment in marriage, what, what the writer of Proverbs is doing here in one way or another, at least we're going to draw from this, and the bigger thing is Scripture, he said you need to run to Jesus. Amen. You need to run to Jesus. <laughs> you know, Ray Ortland, again, good pastor, good Bible scholar, he says this, he says, a tsunami of sexual destruction is slamming us in our modern world today. We need a massive cleansing that only God can give. What can and must we do? We must run to Christ, the mighty friend of sexual fools. See, the ultimate answer is Jesus. The scripture teaches in the very beginning, God created man. Male and female, he created them. That's Adam and Eve. And God had you know, fellowship with them. All they had to do was listen to God. He knew better than them, and they listened to another voice. And what happened is they sinned. They rebelled against God, and that's called the fall. Well, you know, because of the fall, we're all sinners. Because of the fall, we're all broken. Because of the fall, believe it or not, we're, sin has touched every single area of your You don't have any area of your life to say, well, sin didn't touch that area. Every area of your life. That means every single human being, save Jesus from Adam on, was also broken sexually. 
Nothing new under the sun. What we need is Christ. What we need is the gospel, and I'll explain that to you in a minute, because God didn't leave us in a broken state. He promised there'd be a redeemer, and that redeemer would be Jesus. What we do too often with the gospel is this, is we reduce the gospel to you're forgiven of sins and your afterlife is taken care of. You know, those things are great, and the gospel is never less than that, but the gospel is much bigger than that. And the gospel is sufficient for every single area of your life. Martin Luther, a great reformer, said this. He actually uh, explained the gospel in terms of marriage, which the Bible also does. He said this. He said, faith unites the soul with Christ as a bride is united with her bridegroom. From such a marriage, as St. Paul says, it follows that Christ and the soul hold all things in common, whether for better or worse. This means that what Christ possesses belongs to the believing soul, and what the soul possesses belongs to Christ. Thus, Christ possesses all the good things and holiness. These now belong to the soul. That's the believing soul. Um, the scripture goes on. The soul possesses lots of vices and sins. Anybody say amen to that? Amen. The soul, that, that's just the sad state of human affairs because of the fall because of sin, because of our rebellion. I mean, that's just the truth, isn't it? We're, we're not good, cuddly, nice people. We're being the, the, a rebellion against God. God. God wins us and changes us, certainly. But he says, the soul possesses lots of vices and sin. These now belong to Christ. This is the great exchange. Now is, this is Luther. Now is not this a happy business? Christ, listen, Christ, the rich, noble, and holy bridegroom, takes in marriage, this is us now, this poor, contemptible, and sinful little prostitute, takes away all her evil and bestows all his goodness upon her. It is no longer possible for sin to overwhelm her, for she is now found in Christ. The Bible says that he... Well, He's drawing from Corinthians. I'm positive here. He who knew no sin became sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God in him. What does that mean? That's the gospel. Did, he, did Jesus become a sinner? No, he didn't become a sinner. If Jesus became a sinner, he wouldn't be a valid sacrifice. Jesus was always holy. He was always righteous. What this is saying is God took all the sins, all the people that would, all the sinners out there, all your sins and my sins, he take, took all those sins and he placed them on Christ as if they were his, as if they were his, they weren't, as if they were his. He took them and then through faith, he took Christ's righteousness, that's his right standing with God, but it's not only just his right standing with God, that's all his right behavior. He lived an absolutely perfect, sinless holy life, he took that what, status, that achievement, whatever you'd like to call it, took that and he placed it on us and appointed it and gave it to us as if it's ours. So all the perfect obedience of Christ, the holiness of Christ, the righteousness of Christ is now ours. And that sin is no longer counted against us. How does the gospel help us in dealing with difficult how does the gospel help us in dealing with sexual temptation? What is a, there's a full range of ways it helps us. Let me just give you a few hints as to how it might so you can start to use the gospel a little bit better. But, you know, the gospel tells us, uh, well, first of all, the gospel tells us that, that Christ is fully satisfying. Jesus said, you know, if you eat of this bread, he was talking of, of himself, if you eat of this and you drink of this, you're going to never gonna hunger again. You're going to be fully satisfied. What the gospel teaches us about Jesus is that he and he alone is the only one that can fully satisfy the human soul. See, when you go out and you're saying, you know, I, I, I think this guy's for me. I think this woman's for me. I think this little infraction here is okay because I need that. I'm not satisfied. There's a hole in my life here, and I want to do it. You know what you're doing? First of all, you're believing a lie because what you're saying is that Jesus isn't enough. What you're saying is that God. See, you know what we are as Christians? We're believers that are functional unbelievers in so many places because we say, yeah, I believe in Jesus. He saved me from my sins. But functionally, we say, you know, I know the gospel says that Jesus is fully satisfying, but I don't really believe that, so I'm going to satisfy myself here or here or here. We're just talking sex right now. Any of those, those things. Or the gospel says, I mean, if you read it clearly, the gospel says that God is good. And we might be at a place where it's like, 
man, I gotta get this because this is good, and I gotta get this because this is good, and I gotta get this because this is good. And what we're saying functionally is we don't really believe that God is good. We don't believe that God is enough. We say, uh, we say we believe in Jesus, and, and, and what happens is, I mean, this happens all the time. We try to control everything around us. We try to control what happens with our kids. We try to control what happens with our grandchildren. We try to control what happens with our spouse. We're consumed with anxiety and worry when things aren't going our way. You know what? The gospel says that the sovereign Lord is glorious and all-powerful, and he rules and he reigns. And what we say functionally is, I don't really believe that because i got to control it. How's the gospel then? What, what, we need to, what, we need to, what you need to do is preach the gospel to yourself. What you need to do is remind yourself of the gospel. What you need to do when you're being tempted sexually, well, there's a couple of things you need to do. But one of the things you need to do is you need to remind yourself that the gospel says that Jesus is fully satisfying. You need to remind yourself that the gospel says that Jesus is completely good. You need to remind yourself that the gospel says Jesus is enough. But look, as a, as a gospel community, in fact, let me turn with me to Ephesians 4. As a gospel-saturated community, there's something we got to do together. Everybody tracking with me all right? You understand how the gospel can be applied that way? When I say preach the gospel, I'm not saying just, oh, Jesus, you forgave me of your sins, and now i got eternal life. That's great. I'm saying, what does the gospel say? Because what i got is I have a faulty belief system, and i gotta, I got to reorient myself there. In Ephesians chapter 4, we're all familiar, I think, with the, or a lot of us are familiar with the text where Paul is just... Uh, he's instructing the church, and he says in verse 15 of chapter 4, he says, Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way unto him who is the head unto Christ. In other words, he says, you're, you're, you're supposed to be speaking the truth in love to one another, and when we speak the truth in love to one another, we're going to grow up, and we're going to be strong. Now, normally we take this, speaking the truth in love. I, I've taught on this before, but you probably don't remember. We think, wow, that's bringing a hard thing to someone and t telling them that in love. Like there's something that's wrong and that needs to be adjusted in their life. Well, it is that, but it's not even primarily that. Because when you go through the scripture, if you get to verse 21, uh, again, I can't give you all the context, but, well, verse 20, it says that that's not the way you learned Christ. Verse 21, assuming that you have heard about him, about Christ, and assuming that you were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus. Speaking the truth in love is speaking the truth to one another about Jesus. It's speaking the truth of the gospel to one another. It's when you're, when, when, when you're in your small group and somebody's saying, you know what, my supervisor at work is miserable. I've been passed over for promotion. I'm not getting where I should be. I'm being overlooked of all those things. Somebody that's going to speak the truth in love is going to say, you know what, you really, honest to God, you don't deserve any of those things, but you already have the greatest boss there's ever been. And that boss has given you a promotion that you is mind-blowing. You've been seated with him in the heavenly places. There is no better position than that. That's preaching the gospel to one another. When that person is being sexually tempted, you're reminding them to say, wow, you know, Jesus is satisfying. Jesus said, Jesus, and here's the thing. Here's the other thing. In fact, Ray, I think it would be really pertinent for your class. The Bible says, the gospel says there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. If there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, you know what that liberates you to do? To be honest and to confess your sin one to another. You know what Christians, Protestant Christians do a horrible job at? Confessing their sin to one another. I mean, we might be critical of the Catholics, the way they kind of institutionalize confession. Um, but I've had my Catholic friends say, how come you guys don't confess? I said, you know what? We do sometimes, but we don't do it that often. The Bible says confess your sin to one another another one to another and find forgiveness that way and pray for one another here's the truth the gospel says there's no condemnation for those who are in christ jesus then you can be honest with your brother and sister and say look this is what i'm struggling with this is what i'm dealing with this is what uh, i keep falling again and again and again in and you can do that because there's no condemnation for those who are in christ jesus all you can expect or you should expect to find on the other end of that is help not condemnation if anybody else is giving you condemnation it doesn't matter because their vote doesn't count the only one that counts is, is, is Christ. So um, 
Anyhow, let me just summarize this way. Let me give you a couple of practical things, and I'm coming back to the gospel and ending there. Uh, I mean, it's really clear, Proverbs 5, 6, and 7, that you ought to give attention to the Word of God. You want to have a hedge against sexual temptation. You want purity in life. You want purity in marriage. Give attention to the Word of God. The Scripture says, how can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your Word. The Bible says, I've stored up your Word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Here, guys, here's a push. Memorize Scripture. That's it. Treasure it in your heart. I like hide it in your heart. I like that translation better. Put it in your heart. And God has this remarkable ability through the Holy Spirit to cause that word to come to your mind at the appropriate time when you need it. Scripture says, uh, we saw it in Proverbs 5, you got to keep far away. When you can avoid temptation, avoid it. Guard your ears. Guard your eyes. But most of all, at the end of the day, man, run to Jesus. Run to Jesus. The gospel has the answer for you. The gospel has the remedy for you. What you you've sinned and you've stumbled. You may have sinned grievously in, in some kind of sexual way. The Bible teaches that Jesus died on the cross for those sins. Those sins, are, they, they're, they're easy for the blood of Jesus to take care of. And God will not only forgive you of your sins, he will heal you and he will make you whole. But what God will also do is when your situation doesn't change in whatever situation you're in, it's just disappointing and you seem to be faced with this thing, this struggle every single day. You will find out that if you believe the gospel and you trust the gospel and you know the gospel, you will know that Jesus Christ is enough to sustain you. He alone is the one that fully satisfies the soul. Amen? Amen. That's how we conclude, man. Let's, let's preach the gospel to one another. You know, if, we're a God, if we preach the gospel to one another, if we believe in the glory and the grace of God and the forgiveness of God, what we're going to be preaching to one another is grace and forgiveness and redemption and second chance and new life and all of those things. Amen? All right, let's pray. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the truth of your word. And, and, and God, I thank you most of all for, for Jesus. I thank you for the good news of the gospel. I thank you, Lord, for the fact that, yeah, Jesus, you died on the cross for our sins. And, Lord, we can be forgiven. We can have eternal life. I thank you for that, Lord. But I thank you, too, that the gospel has power for our life now. Right now, we're living life now. I thank you that there is power in the gospel now, power to help me resist sexual temptation, this temptation in general, power to help me endure Really, if I'm in a difficult relationship, help me to make better a relationship that's not what it is. Help me to live, if I'm a single uh, particularly, helping me to live purely with joy in a decadent world. Thank you for the power of the gospel, the truth of the gospel. I, I pray, Lord, we'd preach the gospel to one another. We'd believe the gospel together in Jesus' name. Amen.